There's a solitary, humble, wooden structure on a windswept hill in rural New England. To open the door is to engage our minds, our hearts, and our imaginations. In this place, preachers and professors, past and present, come alive as they walk the aisle, ascend the pulpit stairs, and teach. From theology, from history, and from the Word of God, welcome to the Saybrook Meeting House an audio production of Saybrook Ministries. Are you afraid of the dark? When I was a kid, like most kids, I had a problem at bedtime. And the problem was not the hour at which I needed to go to bed. Now, sometimes that was a bummer. I could remember being in the summer, I would hear my older siblings playing when it was still, I was in bed. I was like, this cruel injustice, why is this going on? But usually my, my folks were pretty fair about when bedtime happened. No, the, the, the difficulty at bedtime was a logistical one, and it was this. I had to uh, turn off the light in my room and then cross the eight or 10 feet to my bed in darkness and somehow jump into bed knowing that there might be something underneath my bed that's ready to grab my feet. Like, am I the only one that experienced that? Like, are there any jumpers into bed here with me? Okay. You just never know. You're like, I think I've inspected it, and, uh, but there might be something there. I don't know what that is. We're prone to fear for sure. Um, today's message, uh, I, I mentioned the darkness because we're going to shed some, some literal and some metaphorical and figurative light to send away the darkness as we continue our study in the tabernacle. Now, you recall that the uh, detailed instructions for construction assembly and use of the tabernacle were given directly from God to Moses on Mount Sinai. There was no intermediary there. It was direct instructions from God to Moses. And then it was implemented for purposes of leading and guiding the children of Israel through the wilderness for 40 years. It was also this tabernacle preparing the minds and hearts of the Israelites and future generations for a Messiah who would in himself fulfill all the types and shadows that we saw in the tabernacle. So, take a painted portrait of Christ, divide it into puzzle pieces, the tabernacle is the puzzle pieces. And when you put the puzzle pieces together, understood in relationship to each other, you get Christ. So James started our series uh, in Exodus 25 as we marched through this portion of Scripture where first they raised funds and materials for the tabernacle. Then uh, the way that it, it's in Scripture is it starts with the most important things and radiates out from there. So next, James taught us about the Ark of the Covenant, which was the manifest presence of God there above the mercy seat. Some wonderful truths that we went through with Pastor James there. So that was item number one, and that was in the Holy of Holies. Then we come back out to the holy place, which is separated by a curtain, and we have the table of the bread of the presence, and James talked about that last week. This week, we're going to be talking about the lampstand. That was another item featured in the tabernacle. Uh, Fair warning, if you guys have the bulletin and the outline, I gave that outline to Cindy a couple weeks ago, and it has changed. There's more items on there now, so I apologize. It isn't technically accurate. Write down whatever you want. Also, uh, today, you, uh, I'm going to be in the Scripture a fair amount. We've distributed the Bibles under the seats, uh, as many as we can. I will give you page number references if you want to use the Bible that, is, uh, that are under the seats in front of you. Um, but uh, it not, the Scripture's not going to be on the screens. The, re- the references will, but the Scriptures won't. So I encourage you to either use your app or the Bibles that are provided. 
So part one, the lampstand's blueprint. So let's go to Exodus 25, and 31 to 40 is our text for today. It says this, You shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be made of hammered work. Its base, its stem, its cups, its calyxes, and its flowers shall be of one piece with it. And there shall be six branches going out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand out of one side of it, and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side of it. Three cups made like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flower on one branch, and three cups made like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flower on the other branch. So for the six branches going out of the lampstand. And on the lampstand itself, there shall be four cups made like almond blossoms with their calyxes and flowers, and a calyx of one piece with it under each pair of the six branches going out from the lampstand. Their calyxes and their branches shall be of one piece with it, the whole of it a single piece of hammered work of pure gold. You shall make seven lamps for it. And the, and the lamp shall be set up so as to give light on the space in front of it. Its tongs and their trays shall be of pure gold. It shall be made with all these utensils out of a talent of pure gold. And see that you make them after the pattern for them, which is being shown you on the mountain. These are the words of the Lord and the instructions of the Lord to Moses. And all God's people said... Amen. And by the way, if you're using the Bibles, that's page 60 in the Pew Bibles there if you want to start rolling with me there, Exodus 25. A couple of things we need to notice at the outset. Um, perhaps the simplest one is, why was a lampstand needed? Well, it's dark in there. It's covered with four layers of particular kinds of fabric, and if there's no lampstand, then you're in pitch darkness in the tabernacle. So there needs to be a source of light. Another thing we have to know is that uh, the, the Lord gives the parameters for the construction of the lampstand, very specific parameter, parameters, but he didn't give a drawing as to how it was supposed to look. So when you see artists' renderings, they're giving their guesstimates, just like this uh, gentleman did who gave a, a, a guesstimate drawing of what the lampstand would have looked like made out of gold up there against the gold on the walls, furnishing light to the, to the holy place in the tabernacle. So it was an artisan endeavor. And we even know the name of the project manager who is in charge of making not only the lampstand, but all the other items and broadly the tabernacle itself. So if you want to turn to page 76 in your pew Bibles, Exodus 35 Let's go to Exodus 35 really quick. And we see verses 30 through 35. And it says this. Then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood, for work in every skilled craft. And he has inspired him to teach both him and Aholiab, the son of Ahissamach of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to do every sort of work done by an engraver, or by a designer, or by an embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen, or by a weaver, by any sort of workman or skilled designer. Now, something interesting to note is that Bezalel's fame continues to this day. There's an art school in Israel named after Bezalel that has an ongoing uh, attendance of about 2,000 students every year that go through this Academy of Art. So his, his name is recorded well for us. How was the lampstand then to be kept burning? 
Somehow the light has to be kept burning. How is this going to happen? Leviticus 24, if you turn to page 102 in your Bibles, the Pew Bibles, Leviticus 24 is where we're going, starting verse 1 through 4. Leviticus 24, 1 through 4. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the people of Israel to bring you pure oil from beaten olives for the lamp, that a light may be kept burning regularly, outside the veil of the testimony in the tent of meeting. That's another phrase that the Scripture uses for the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. Aaron shall arrange it from evening to morning before the Lord regularly. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. He shall arrange the lamps on the lampstand of pure gold before the Lord regularly. So again, to backtrack a little, so there's no CAD blueprint for the lampstand. It's an artisan design that the Lord is empowering and entrusting Bezalel and those that he teaches to do. You notice it's made out of, it's a hammered work. So uh, those of you that know anything about manufacturing know that when you're using metals, you can use uh, molds and you can pour molten metal into a mold and fashion something that way. But that's not how this was done. This was taking, there was probably some heating involved, but it was only hammering. They weren't casting molds or anything like that. So to show you by way of difference, so when you see like the symbols on my drum set uh, involve both casting and hammering. So when those symbols start out, they start out as a disc of bronze and tin that looks like a little bowl like this. You can actually hit it with a drumstick and it makes, even at that stage, it makes a pleasant tone like a bell. Then it goes through all kinds of uh, lathing and crushing and shaping with heat and various liquids applied to it. Uh, the Zildjian Company, which goes back, probably it has to be one of the oldest companies uh, recorded that's still in existence, uh, the Zildjian symbol, symbol company is 400 years old. They started in Turkey. And their secret recipe for mixing bronze and tin to get that result is a family recipe that's been, it's like KFC, it's been passed down and it's, it's secret. It's, only the family members know it and you have to get the recipe right, otherwise the, the, the metal just gets destroyed in that process. So it starts out as a mold, and with symbols, the last thing you do is hammering. And you, you'll see indentations in the symbol. That's what gives it its pleasing tone. And there are guys that hand hammer symbols. It looks, it's a very old process. There's guys who are at today make symbols. The last part of the process is hammering indentations into that symbol to give it its final resonance. So the symbols are using both. It's both a mold and hammering. But the lampstand is just custom hammering. So that's the construction of it, and that's our main text for today that describes it. But obviously the lampstand has implications, and that's what I want to have us look at today. There's a reason God put the lampstand there. There's a reason that God designed it the way he did. There's a reason uh, there's inferences of meaning and type and shadow in Scripture that the Scripture itself helps illuminate. So the second point, uh, part two of this message is the lampstand's power. The lampstand's power, according to Daniel. Now, you might, we're going to be in Daniel 5 if you want to start turning there. That's on page 742 in your pew Bibles. You might recall that holiness and power were attributed to all the tabernacle implements and elements that were set apart and consecrated to the Lord. For example, we read about the power of the Ark of the Covenant when we preached through First and Second Samuel, both in a showdown with the Philistine god Dagon, which was almost comical. Remember the Dagon idol kept falling over in the presence of the Ark. And... So the Dagon episode showed the holiness of the ark, and then the unholiness of man in comparison to the ark was shown to us in the story of Uzzah, who, remember, he reached out and tried to touch the ark to re 
rebalance it. He was afraid it was going to fall down. And it falls off, and he gets, or it doesn't fall off, but in his attempt, he gets killed. The Lord strikes him dead right there. And you remember David's reaction to that? He was like, oh, that's great, Lord. Thank you for that, Thank you for that ratification of your holiness. No, he was upset. He was like, Lord, he was trying to help the ark. Why did you kill him? And the Lord, in essence, re- replied, you know nothing of my holiness. Nothing. I've instructed you clearly on how to transport this set-apart object that's been imbued with the holiness of God. Remember, we can't even look at God. Just the, just the echo of the image of God in the face of Moses struck the Israelites with terror. They said, don't look at us. Get away from us. That was just reflection. So there's power there. Now let's go to Daniel 5 because you might be like, lampstand, Daniel 5. What in the world is, what happened to Ben here? I thought he went, he went off the rails a little bit. Okay, so Daniel 5, if you're there, again, page 742 in your pew Bibles. I'm going to read verses 1 through 9 and then we're going to talk about it a little bit. So, this starts off talking about King Belshazzar. Now, Belshazzar is uh, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Also, in, when uh, Daniel 5 is happening, Daniel himself is about probably 80 years old, just FYI. All right, King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, now in, in Hebrew there, that also means grandfather. It's the same, same word. But Nebuchadnezzar is his grandfather. Had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem, be brought. So he's saying, bring me the consecrated holy stuff so I can drink wine out of it. That the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from, drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. So among those things is included the lampstand, which started in the tabernacle, ends up in the temple, gets taken by the Babylonians when the Babylonians, uh, during the exile, okay? Now, what happens? We know this is probably not going to go well. Immediately... The fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. Here's the key part. Opposite the lampstand. You probably don't remember that part. The hands appeared on the wall opposite the lampstand. So the lampstand itself is illuminating this judgment. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. Some commentators, by the way, speculate that really what the Hebrew is getting out at there is he soiled himself. He was so afraid. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. So he's desperate. Somebody tell me what this means. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, and his color changed, and his lords were perplexed. Then what happens? So the queen tells Belshazzar, call for Daniel. They call Daniel in. Now remember, Daniel's probably about 80 years old at this point, and he's seen a lot. He's gone through a lot already. And he's, uh, uh, to, at the least, uh, I would say he is not a fan of Belshazzar, all right? Because Daniel has attempted to be faithful to Yahweh under a Babylonian captivity, and, and he see, all he sees here is drunken debauchery. And Belshazzar says to Daniel, I'll make you third in the kingdom. Tell me what this means. And Daniel answers, in essence, you can keep your gifts, and you can keep your title, but I will tell you what it means. Daniel says, your grandpa thought he was king of the world. And the Lord said, no, you're not. And so for seven years, he made your grandpa, Nebuchadnezzar, 
walk around on all fours eating grass like he was an animal. And at the end of that time, Daniel recounts to Belshazzar, remember this is a thousand people are in this room and Daniel's having a one-off with Belshazzar. And he's saying, what happened after that time? Your grandpa recognized my God is God. That's what happened. Your God, Daniel, is the true God. The Bible says, until he knew, he being Nebuchadnezzar, that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And Daniel says, you have not humbled your, your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house, Daniel said, have been brought in before you, the holy vessels. And so in this act of irony, Daniel doesn't say this, but I'm saying this, God uses the holy vessel of his temple that started out in the tabernacle, the lampstand, to illuminate the very message of judgment that was going to fall on Belshazzar that day. And Daniel interprets the writing on the wall, which essentially said, you've been weighed and found wanting, and your reign is at an end. And Belshazzar was thankful for the interpretation, and actually did robe Daniel and said, okay, you're third in my kingdom. That night, as they're speaking, and Daniel said, you're done. You're toast. That's what that writing says. That night, as they're speaking, the Medes and Persians are sneaking in under the city wall, which Babylon thought was impregnable, and Belshazzar was killed that night. Our God is pretty amazing. And he doesn't mess around. This is an example, just like Uzzah, where the Lord is saying, I put up with a lot of things from sinful humanity. But there are times when if you are going to take my holy vessel and have a drunken bacchanalia, in essence giving me the finger, let me tell you how this is going to end for you. Belshazzar, it ends for you tonight. So that's a passage that you probably wouldn't identify with the lampstand or the tabernacle. But that's that same piece of furniture, and it's not a coincidence that your scripture tells you that message of judgment was illuminated by the tabernacle, by, by the uh, lampstand, rather. Part three, the lampstand's fulfillment. So we're going to have a lot of fulfillment. I wanted to show you the power, but now we're going to have the lampstand's fulfillment according to Simeon. So let's go to Luke 2, and that's page 857 in your Bibles. Luke chapter 2, Gospel of Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 21. Luke 2, starting at verse 21. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. One of the best titles of Jesus is the consolation of Israel, isn't it? And the Holy Spirit was upon him, that is, Simeon. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. Now verse 32, listen. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. So Simeon says, Jesus is the light. 
What was the only source of light in the tabernacle? The lampstand. So I'm going to be drawing connections here between the lampstand and our Savior, the light of the world. We next go part four to the lampstand's fulfillment according to Jesus. That's page 859, Luke 4, page 859 in your Bibles. So now we're going to hear what Jesus is saying. We're going to start at verse 16. And uh, go to 21, and then we'll continue a little bit. The first thing I want to look at, 16 through 21. And he, that is Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. Now he's talking from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering, listen to this, sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now what's interesting about that is the normal pattern of what they would do there is after he had read the scripture, he would sit down and exposit it. So he has a one-line sermon. His sermon is, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, what happens after that? So verse 18, I'm going to recover sight to the blind. I'm going to give light to the blind. What happens after that? Now this is interesting. Verse 22 continues, And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. So initially the reaction is, wow, this is powerful and interesting. And it's not adversarial. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? And he, that is Jesus, said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. And what we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he, that is Jesus, said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth... I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. So what he said is this, I know what you guys are about. And that's why he says a prophet is without honor in his own hometown. And he reminds them, and this comes to them as a stinging rebuke. He says, remember when Elijah went and ministered to uh, uh, all the Jews? No, that's when they rejected Elijah. And he's saying, he's using Elisha as an example of, no, it wasn't God's people, the Israelites. It was Naaman the Syrian that the Lord had Elisha interact with and help and heal. So what they hear that, they hear that as a stinging rebuke when Jesus is saying, hey, don't get, get off your high horse here. I came as a light to the Gentiles as well. Now what's their reaction? Verse 28, when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill, uh, the hill rather, on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But he passed through their midst and went away. So we don't know exactly what happened there. Jesus obviously can do stuff that we can't do, but um, we don't, the Bible doesn't say exactly how he passed through the crowd. So it quickly turns from, wow, this is interesting and compelling, to, 
responding to this stinging rebuke from Jesus when he says, yes, I am the light of the world. I've come to bring sight to the blind. But just like the, the Jewish, the Israelites uh, rejected Elijah and the Jewish uh, uh, rejected rather Elisha, you're going to reject me as well. Remember Ahab, who was adversarial with Elijah, was a Jew. Those kings, those nefarious kings, those were lions, those were Israelites who were flouting God and saying, no, we will not follow you. And hey, you prophet of God, we hate you too. So Luke chapter 4 gives us this fulfillment from Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 61 where Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. I'm going to open the eyes of the blind. Now skip over to Luke 24, page 885. And you guys have heard this, these verses before, but they're really important and integral to understanding what's going on here. Starting at verse 25. Remember, Luke 24, on the road to Emmaus, why is the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus in our Bibles? It's because of verses 25 through 27. It's otherwise, uh, it's not there to just tell some interesting story where Jesus is having fun with disciples that can't recognize him and don't know who he is. The reason that that story is in your Bibles is verses 25 through 27. When he's talking to these disciples, they don't recognize who he is. It's after the resurrection. He says, what's happened in these last few days? And they, they're incredulous. They say, what's wrong with you? What do you mean what's happened? Where have you been? Because they don't know it's Jesus. And then, verse 25, And he said to them, Jesus did, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Verse 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures all the things concerning himself. So part of that discussion is, my disciple friends, the tabernacle, which gets extensive real estate in your Old Testament. He's saying to them, you remember the tabernacle? Let's talk about the Ark of the Covenant. Let's talk about the mercy seat. Let's talk about the table of the bread of the presence and me as the bread of life. Let's talk about the lampstand and me who brings sight to the blind and is the light of the world. Let's talk about that. He's opening the whole Old Testament. These, these verses are key for helping us to understand that Jesus said the whole Old Testament from Genesis 1-1 to, what's the last one, Malachi? Uh, to the very last verse of Malachi, it's about me. It all points to me. That's critical for us to understand. So then go over to John 3. John chapter 3. 888 in your, in your Bibles, John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verses 10 through 20. So, he's talking to Nicodemus, who's a Pharisee. Many of you have heard this story. We'll start at verse 10. And he's talking about being born again. And Nicodemus is getting confused. He says, well, how can I re-enter my mom's womb? I don't understand any of this. And Jesus said, no, 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 you're, you're born again by the Spirit and the Spirit alone. Verse 10 says, Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For so God 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Now listen to verses 19 and 20. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. The light has come into the world. Jesus couldn't be more clear, right? So, was Jesus compelling and persuasive as a miracle worker? Was Jesus compelling and persuasive as one having control over nature? Was Jesus compelling and persuasive as he received the ratification and endorsement of the law and the prophets on the Mount of Transfiguration manifested by Moses and Elijah? Was Jesus compelling and persuasive in his humility? Was Jesus compelling and persuasive as he walked the road to Calvary with the burden of your sin and my sin upon his back? The answer is yes, 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 yes. Yes, he was compelling and persuasive. Nevertheless, Our sin infection is so deep, so powerful, so stubborn, so disturbing, that despite all that, many did not believe. Many, 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 many did not believe. And many who pretended to believe turned away. Let that sink in for a minute. John chapter 8. Move ahead just a few pages. John chapter 8. Starting at verse 12. John chapter 8, verse 12, just verses 12 and 13. Again, Jesus spoke to them, this is talking to the Pharisees, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And this, was, this report was received with glee and admiration by the Pharisees. Okay, read verse 13. So the Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. That's the Pharisees ratifying everything I said. Men love the darkness. A chapter later in John, we are seeing the same problem. In John chapter 9, Jesus heals a man who had been blind from birth, you recall. And the Pharisees can't believe it, so they call the guy who's been blind from birth and they say, how did, how did you get healed? What happened? And the guy says, I don't know. This guy, Jesus, healed me. I don't know. What do you want to know? Then they call in his parents and say, okay, you can leave now. Okay, mom and dad, what's the story here? Has he really been blind from birth? Have, they're like, yeah, he's been blind from birth. Did this guy, Jesus, really heal him? Uh, yeah, they did. as far as we know, that's, we, all we can tell you is he's been blind from birth and he sees now. And they said, okay, you guys can leave. Let's call the blind guy back. So they call the blind guy back. Chapter 9. If you flip over to chapter 9, verse 32. So, they call the blind guy back a second time. And now the blind guy's getting, the formerly blind guy's getting exasperated and saying, what do you want me to say? He heals me. He has the power to heal me. And the Pharisees don't want to hear it. So starting at verse 32, Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? 
The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, You are God's? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Again they sought to arrest him. But he escaped from their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. So, Jesus, by his own testimony, was the light. Jesus was the lampstand foretold. But his light was unique in that it served to save and rescue some and to stiffen the resistance of others. That brings us to part five, the lampstand's fulfillment according to John. Back to John chapter one, page 886 in your Bibles. John chapter one, starting at verse six, six through 13. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So there John is... Spoiler alert, he's just agreeing with Jesus. The light came into the world, and the world did not know him. Now, a very important verse, flip over to Revelation, very end of your Bible, Revelation chapter 21. And it's just a couple lines, but it's very important. Revelation chapter 21, verses 22 through 25. And I saw no temple in the city, this is the New Jerusalem, for its temple is the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and listen to this, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. All right, so John has given his testimony. Part six, let's move on to Paul. Acts 26, page 935. Acts 26. And that one in Revelation is a linchpin because it gives you, it draws a straight line from the lamp to Jesus as the lamb. Part six, the lamp stands fulfillment according to Paul. Acts 26, verses 12 through 18. Paul is saying, before King Agrippa, talking about his conversion testimony. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests on his way to murder more Christians. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Isn't it interesting? Jesus personifies when the church is persecuted. Jesus is persecuted. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, 
to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes. There it is again. So that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So how does Jesus appear to Paul as a light? It isn't just an accident, guys. He's the light of the world. He appears to murderous Saul as a light. The lamp stands fulfillment according to Peter. Might as well get through all the rest of the apostles here real quick. Part 7, the lamp stands fulfillment according to Peter. So you might be saying, okay, Ben, I get it, but help me understand my relation to this story. As a Christian, where do I fit in with the lampstand? 1 Peter 2, page uh, 1014 in your Bibles. 1 Peter 2, starting at verse 4 and going through 9. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be, here it is, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. And verse 9, here he goes again. But you... Christian, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So if you're a Christian, because you're a royal priesthood, you get to now be in the presence of the lampstand 24-7. It's not just the high priest. We get to be in the presence of the light of the lampstand 24-7. Finally, part eight, the lampstand's application. If Christ is the light, if Christ is the lamp, then this will have obvious ramifications for us who are in the church, the body of Christ. And I'll just go to two locations. Ephesians 5, that's page 978 in your Bibles. Ephesians 5. And then we'll be in Matthew 5. But Ephesians 5 first. Verses 1 through 11. So, if we're the body of Christ, and if Christ is the lamp, what are we supposed to do about it? Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience." Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. 
walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Matthew 5. Matthew 5, page 810. If you've got the Pew Bible, go Matthew 5. Verses starting at verse 14, 14, 15, and 16. Matthew 5, 14, 15, and 16. This is in the Beatitudes. You, talking to believers here, are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Lights are meant to both be seen and to help others see. Are you seen by others as a faithful witness to Christ? Are you willing and ready to be seen as a faithful witness to Christ? Do you help others see that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life? Are you willing and ready to help others see that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life? Jesus left us here as beacons of hope leading others to him, the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world, and we're his beacons of hope. And the power of your light is a reflection of how closely you are tethered to the original source. And I would capitalize original source. The vast majority of our fellow man is bereft lacking a saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a tragic truth. In the parlance of scriptures, they are blind, stumbling around in the dark. As Lincoln said when we traveled to Portland uh, last month, you could feel it. Portland has retreated into pagan darkness. What helps the luster and luminosity of your light? Hewing closely to Scripture, praying earnestly and often, as Nathan challenged us, singing praises and thanksgiving to the Lord, consistently meeting with your brothers and sisters. Does that sound like church? It does, doesn't it? What dims and darkens the light of our witness? We heard some of it in today's scriptures. Filthiness, foolish talk, crude joking, disobedience. Elsewhere in the epistles, Paul adds other sobering descriptors. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander, anger, bitterness. Those are marks of darkness. In fact, even those who do not follow Christ have a sufficient cognizance of God, Paul tells us in Romans 1, that they know those are marks of darkness as well, and they they don't have an excuse. But Christian, for you, darkness is not your destiny. In fact, when you trusted in Christ, whether you know it or not, you became a soldier in a war against darkness. And it's a war whose ultimate victory, Jesus, the light of the world, has irrevocably and irreversibly sealed. The victory is sealed, friends. Jesus said, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Isaiah saw it in his messianic visions. The people who walked in darkness have seen what? A great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. And David sang of it. 
The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? There's a great word that theologians sometimes apply to Scripture, and it's this, perspicuous. What does it mean? Clearly expressed or presented. Lucid. What you've read and heard today is not lacking in clarity. When it comes to Jesus as the fulfillment of the type and shadow of the tabernacle lampstand and Jesus as the light of the world, the scripture is like the Luxor sky beam. The Luxor sky beam is the world's most powerful searchlight. And it beams from the top of the pyramid-shaped Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas. The beam concentrates over 13 million lumens. For those of us that know how many lumens this thing is, that's a lot. Nine billion candle power. So the question is not whether Jesus is who and what he says he is. That's abundantly clear. The question is, will you be among those for whom the light of Christ acts like a, a welder's beam that seals eyes and seals and hardens calcified hearts? Is that going to be your response? Or will you be among those whose interaction with the light of Christ results in open eyes? and regenerated, beating, living hearts. Are you unsure where you stand? The Savior, the lampstand, the light, Jesus Christ, has been receiving, restoring, and healing blind beggars from every corner of the globe for millennia. Amen? Seek him earnestly this morning and see what he will do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, our great shepherd and our light, we praise you for your goodness. We praise you that we have come to see that your light is not something that's going to seal us to damnation or seal our calcified hearts. But rather, Lord, those of us in this room that trust in you and call you Lord have surrendered ourselves to your light. So, Lord, I would pray that everybody who can hear what I'm saying and that here's the clear witness of your word, would understand and appreciate that you came to bring truth in, and light, and in you is no darkness. So Lord, help us, give us your Holy Spirit to enable us to follow you, and then conform us to your image, which includes us reflecting your light. And Lord, I pray that it would be inexplicable to those around us, that they would see that the light that we shine, which is from you, is from another place entirely. And that they would see that it's, it has a divine source, and they would see it as compelling. And so that all who would hear of this wonderful news would realize that no matter what horrible things they've done in rebellion against you and against your created order and against your word, you still say, I am the light for you if you trust me. So Lord, help us to trust you, not just today, not just tomorrow, forever, until we're with you in the new heavens and the new earth, where we need no sun, because you, our glorious sacrificial lamb, are the lamp and the light. And all God's people said, Amen.
Thank you for joining us this week at the Saybrook Meeting House. We hope you've been blessed by today's podcast. Saybrook Ministries' mission is to provide didactic and devotional content from the Christian faith delivered to the saints, recovered and refined by the Protestant Reformation. Be sure to visit saybrookministries.org for continually updated Christian content designed to inspire and invigorate our imagination and intellect. Join us next week for another journey to the Saybrook Meeting House. Until then, may God bless you.